Thank you, Patricia, for that uh, introduction. Good afternoon, everybody, to those who are tuned in, and welcome to this uh, quincentennial lecture of the Cebu City Cultural and Historical Affairs Office. For the next uh, hour or so, we shall, I shall share with you the fruits of my research and observations over the past 30 years of my life uh, of the different Lenten practices throughout the country. So even if we are uh, broadcasting from Cebu, we will not be talking merely about Cebu or Cebuano practices, but uh, as the title of this talk suggests, Quaresmang Pinoy, that means uh, something that is uh, prevalent all over the Philippine Islands. And so let's go on. Uh, let's start with the lecture proper. Okay. So we will be talking about Quaresmang Pinoy, the main and popular Filipino piety associated with Lent. So let's start off with the Lenten characters. And the whole, in the Lenten characters, we start off with the holy male of the Lent of the Lenten species. It's it's a bit humorous there because uh, there are also unholy ones. So first off, we have San Pedro Arrepentado or the repentant Saint Peter. He is always uh, takes the lead in any Lenten procession because the image of the repentant Saint Peter, as you can see on your screen to the left, the big one, the image of a repentant Peter is actually what Lent is all about. When Holy Mother, the Church, calls us for 40 days to review our conduct, and uh, repent of our sins and turn back to God. And St. Peter best exemplified that. That's why if you're wondering why in uh, Lenten processions all over the country, not only here in Cebu or in the Visayas, it's always the image of the repentant Peter that takes the lead before all the other characters. Next slide. Okay. Uh, there is also, of course, the beloved disciple, St. John the Evangelist. Uh, he, is, uh, he was the youngest of the 12 apostles called by Christ to the ministry. Some resources say he was either 16 or 17 years old. So that is the reason why he is called the beloved disciple, because being the youngest in the group of 12 grown men, he was the most tender, and as such, he was very physically and emotionally close to the Lord Jesus. By the way, St. John the Evangelist uh, wrote the fourth gospel and the book of the Revelation, as well as three letters. And they're all included in the New Testament. Among the 12 apostles, Jesus Christ chose St. John the Evangelist to take care of Our Lady when he handed, concern, he handed care of her to him in Calvary. And he's the also the only one apostle that did not die of old age, that did not die as a martyr, but died of old age of natural causes. Well, the other 11 apostles were martyred for their faith. St. John died in the island of Patmos in Greece as an exile for being a Christian. The exile came about when he did not die as a martyr, despite being placed in a cauldron of boiling oil. This event is still commemorated today in the Tridentine Liturgy on May 6th and is entitled St. John Before the Latin Gate. Next of the male species, we have St. Joseph of Arimathea, described in the Gospels as a rich old man and a secret disciple of Jesus Christ who spoke for him before the Sanhedrin. He boldly asked Pilate for the dead body of Jesus Christ to be properly buried, which is actually against the provision of Roman law in the, in the disposition of dead bodies of condemned criminals. Joseph offered his own tomb to be used for the burial of Jesus. Legend says that St. Joseph of Arimathea then fled Israel during the first wave of Christian persecution, about 60 AD, and Christianized the town of Lustenberry 
in Somerset, England. Another holy male of the species is Saint Nicodemus. He was a secret disciple of Jesus Christ who came to him at night. It was through Nicodemus that Jesus taught the doctrine of being born again in spirit, that is, being baptized in the Holy Spirit to be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus, together with Joseph of Arimathea and John the Evangelist, helped bury the dead body of Jesus. He also bought 100 pounds of embalming spices to Calvary for use in embalming the dead body of Jesus. And very few uh, people know that Lunginus uh, became a saint. Saint Lunginus, actually an unnamed Roman soldier, was present at the crucifixion. And he was the one who thrust a spear into the side of the Lord Jesus as an act of coup de gras to end the suffering of this prisoner, not to kill him because killing an already condemned criminal is against Roman law. He did it as an act of coup de gras, thinking that Jesus was still alive and suffering. But actually when Longinus did the coup de gras thrust, Jesus was already dead. When blood and water flowed out from the wound, and some drops hit his blinded right eye, Longinus was able to regain his sight and proclaimed, truly, this man is the son of God. The name Longinus, which actually means long spear in Latin, was given to him. Those who saw the movie, The Passion of the Christ, he was given the name Cassius. Thereafter, he converted to Christianity and became an ardent Christian preaching to his fellow soldiers. Eventually, he died for it. And his beheading, his martyrdom, is commemorated annually in the Moriones Festival of Marinduque Island in the province of Luzon, called Ugutan. Again, another little-known saint is Saint Dismas, or Saint Dimas the Good Thief. He was one of the two criminals condemned to die on the cross and be crucified with Jesus on Calvary. While the other prisoner named Hestas was insulting the Lord Jesus, this mass rebuked him and professed his faith in the messianic mission of Jesus Christ. He even asked Jesus to remember him when he's already in his kingdom, to which the Lord Jesus replied, today you will be with me in paradise. Saint Dismas is a patron saint of ex-convicts who have served time in prison and is starting a new life. He is the only Roman Catholic saint personally canonized by Jesus himself. What an honor, no? A thief, uh, a criminal according to Roman law, a bad guy, saved on the 11th hour. His feast day is celebrated on March 25th together with the Feast of the Annunciation. Now we also have the less holy ones of the characters in Lent. And of course, first and foremost among them is Judas Iscariot. He was uh, one of the 12 apostles chosen by the Lord Jesus. He was the treasurer of the group who, according to St. John's Gospel, helped himself to the money intended for the group, the donations given by the supporters, especially the women, uh, the rich women followers. His stop for money led him to betray the Lord Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, amounting to about 20,000 pesos in today's value. But then during the time, the first century, that must have been a very big amount already. Judas could have repented and returned to the flock, but he, was, he instead despaired and hung himself, dying a wicked man's death. According to the venerable Fulton Shin, the greatest tragedy of Judas was that he could have been Saint Judas. And then we have the unwilling player, Pontius Pilate. 
He is not a saint in the Roman Catholic Church, although I understand he is considered as a saint in the Greek Orthodox. But the Greek Orthodox is not in communion with the Roman Church, so they can have their own cluster of saints separate from us. No? He was the Roman governor of Judea in the time of Jesus. He believed that Jesus was innocent and wanted to release him. But the chief priest threatened to renounce him before the emperor Tiberius Caesar. His wife, Claudia Procola, even warned her, warned him not to have anything to do with condemning of Jesus of Nazareth. But the loss of his political career and the ire of the emperor made him submit to the perverted sense of justice of the Jews. Pilate. Pilate's story teaches us to be courageous enough to stand for our faith, no matter the consequences. Claudia Procola, again, she is not a saint in the Roman Catholic Church, although together with her husband, the two are considered saints in the Greek Orthodox Church. Let me repeat, the Greek Orthodox Church is not in communion with the Roman Catholic Church. So whatever they do, we have nothing to do with it. We Roman Catholics have nothing to do with it. Claudia warned Pilate not to have anything to do with this Jesus of Nazareth, as she had a dream, warning her of dire consequences if Pontius Pilate got involved in the mock trial. That is why Pontius Pilate washed his hands after giving in to the pressure of the mob. But washing your hands after you pronounce a judgment on somebody does not, does not cut it. I mean, you handed the sentence, the death sentence, so you are responsible for it. That's why in our Apostles' Creed, we always profess that the Lord Jesus Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate. If you remember your Apostles' Creed, which we recite every Sunday or every time we pray the Holy Rosary. And then there is the, the, the fox, as the Lord Jesus called him once, Herod Antipas. No? He was a Roman puppet and made Tetrarch of Galilee in the time of Jesus of Nazareth. He was the one who had John the Baptist beheaded. He's the son of Herod the Great, who ordered the massacre of the innocents in Bethlehem. He took as his wife, his sister-in-law Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, another puppet tetrarch. Pilate sent Jesus of Nazareth to him for his judgment, since he is from Galilee. But Herod instead wanted Jesus to perform a miracle of turning stones into bread to feed his household. When Jesus did not oblige, he dispatched him back to Pilate for his final judgment. Simon of Cyrene, Simon Cyreneo. In the fifth station of the traditional way of the cross, <clears throat> the Roman soldiers compelled an onlooker along the Via Dolorosa to help Jesus carry the cross, who at that point was already weakened by the torture and the heavy weight of the cross. He was identified in the Synaptic Gospels as Simon of Cyrene. Although his two sons, named Rufus and Alexander, became disciples of the Lord, Simon is not a saint in the Roman Catholic Church because he helped Jesus out of compulsion by the Roman soldiers and not by compassion. The story of the Cyrenian teaches us that hypocritical religiosity does not mean anything. And then if we had a good thief in the person of St. Dismas, another thief who was crucified with the Lord in Calvary was known as the bad thief. And he is given the name Estas, el mal ladron in Spanish, or just as the bad thief. Instead of begging for mercy and acknowledging his sin like his other uh, prisoner did, he mocked the Lord Jesus and even challenged him to get down from the cross and save himself and them. 
He provides an anticlimactic character to the good thief, Dismas, who rebuked him for his blasphemous utterances. Gestas, or Hestas, died unrepented. When we are given the chance, even in the 11th hour, to turn back to God, we should take advantage of this, of his pardon and mercy, instead of mocking him in disbelief. Now, we have the faithful women disciples. And in the lead is St. Mary Magdalene or Santa Maria Magdalena, the chief woman disciple from whom Jesus exercised seven demonic possessions. She's a rich businesswoman from Mag Magada or Magdala, probably a fishmonger because Magdala is a known fishing port, a rich fishing port during the Roman colonial times. She and the other women disciples used their own finances for the needs of Jesus and the apostles. She was appointed by Jesus to be the apostle to the apostles to announce his resurrection to the 11 disciples. Mistakenly identified as a prostitute, adulteress, woman of ill repute, because of a Lenten sermon by St. Pope Gregory the Great in the 6th century, who conflated the identity of the sinful woman, the adulteress, with St. Mary Magdalene. In Philippine history, St. Mary Magdalene became the unwilling patroness of the Katipunan Magdalo faction, being the patron saint of Kawit Kabiti. General Emilio Aguinaldo also borrowed her name Magdalo, as his nom de gear during the Philippine Revolution against Spain. St. Mary Magdalene is fitted on July 22. In the Triditan liturgy, her affiliation was penitent, and the gospel reading is from John's account of Calvary. In the Novos Ordo, the gospel reading on her feast day is already about the resurrection of Jesus. Pope Francis also recently elevated her obligatory memorial on July 22 into a feast equal to the commemoration of the apostles. Next, we have La Santa Mujer Veronica or Saint Veronica. The sixth station in the traditional way of the cross features a woman who wiped the blooded face of Jesus on the way to Calvary. The unnamed woman was given the moniker La Santa Mujer Veronica, or the Holy Woman with the True Image. Veronica is a corruption of the Latin words vera and icon, which evolved into Veronica over the years. The imprint of the blooded face of the Lord in Veronica's veil is extant and is safely guarded relic in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. The relic gave impetus to the devotion to the holy face of Jesus, also known as Divino Rostro in Spanish and Volto Santo in Italian. Veronica's veil is exposed to the public inside St. Peter's Basilica only once a year during Lent. In Veronica, St. Veronica is treated traditionally on February 4, but the Bolandists celebrate her feast on July 12. She is invoked by those suffering from blood-related diseases, such as diabetes, hemophilia, etc. Now we have Saint Salome, the wife of Zebedee and mother of the apostles James the Elder and John the Evangelist. She was criticized for speaking to the Lord on behalf of her, of her two boys requesting that they sit by his side, one on his right and the other on his left. Her passion emblem is a censor because she offered her two boys to the service of the gospel. She was a faithful woman disciple who stood by the cross in Calvary at a distance together with the other women disciples. She was also among the women who went to the tomb on the first Easter morning and was favored by a vision of the risen Christ. Her name, Salome, is a derivative of the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace or pass in Spanish. Her saintly emblem is a censer or terrible. 
A feast day is listed in the Roman Martyrology for, December, for October 22. <clears throat> Saint Mary of James or Santa Maria Jacobi. Saint Mary of James is the mother of the apostles Saint James the Younger and Saint Jude Tadeus. She is the widow of Alpheus. She is referred to as Mary of James because in Hebrew culture, a widowed woman is placed under the authority and responsibility of her eldest son. So she has been referred to as Mary of James after her firstborn son, St. James the Younger. She was present in Calvary as well as in the first Easter morning when the Lord was resurrected and appeared to the woman disciples, to the women disciples. Her passion emblem is the Roman whip or flagellum which is commonly mistaken as a broom in some of her iconographies. There is a strong devotion to St. Mary of James and St. Salome together in Southern France, dating back to the 12th century. She is fitted on May 23 in the Roman Martyrology, third edition. is not a blood sister of the Blessed Virgin Mary, but a sister-in-law. Because according to a second century historian, Saint Hegesippus, Clopas is a brother of Saint Joseph. So she is referred to by John as sister because as I said earlier, in Hebrew usage, the term Adelphi refers to all the women relatives, regardless of degree. This is the reason why she stayed with the Blessed Mother at the foot of the soul, her sorrowing sister-in-law. Her passion emblem is the crown of thorns. Her feast day is celebrated on April 9 in the old Roman calendar, or pre-1965. So, St. Mary of James and St. Mary of Clopas are clearly two uh, distinct women disciples not related to each other. Then we have the famous cook of the Lord, St. Martha of Bethany. St. Martha was a close friend of the Lord and host whenever he visits the village of Bethany, which is just about 80 kilometers out of Jerusalem. She is the elder sister of the siblings Mary of Bethany and Lazarus. St. Martha is known as the cook of the Lord who complained that her sister Mary is not helping her in the kitchen. But she was rebuked by Jesus, telling her that listening to his words is more important than preparing food. St. Martha professed her belief in the divinity of Jesus Christ and in the resurrection of the dead. She is the patroness of social workers, cooks, and hoteliers. Her passion emblem is a basket of bread, and fruit, a ladle, and a bundle of keys, or an aspergillum, because of a legend in Tarascon, France, that Saint Martha vanquished a fierce monster by sprinkling it with holy water. So either of the two emblems would do, but for Lent, more appropriately would be uh, the basket of food. After all, the Lord Jesus was also offered as our Paschal lamb on Lent. Martha, we have her younger sister, St. Mary of Bethany. She's the sister of Martha and Lazarus, friends of the Lord. The Gospel of John identified her as the woman who anointed the, feet, the head and feet of Jesus with expensive aloe in the house of Simon the leper, probably spikenard, which is still very expensive up to today. She is not identified with the other un unnamed woman who also anointed Jesus in another situation. Her passion emblem is a bottle of perfume and her long flowing hair with which she wiped the foot of Jesus. St. Mary of Bethany, whose identity was hidden for so long, has finally been given an equivalent 
canonization by Pope Francis himself on February 2, 2021, and assigning July 27 as her feast day, together with her siblings, Martha and Lazarus. Next, we have Santa Juana de Cusa, or Saint Juana, wife of Chusa. Okay, in the Gospel of Luke, Saint Juana, wife of Chusa, was named as one of the women who financed the movement of the apostles with their own money. She must have been a woman of great financial resources because her husband Chusa was the chief steward in the house or in the palace of Herod Antipas. Person, the, her passion emblem is a jewelry box symbolizing her wealth, which she willingly shared uh, for the movement of Jesus and the apostles during her time. We have Santa Futina, La Samaritana, another saint whose uh, saintly identity recently just came out. Her conversion was recorded in chapter 4 of John's Gospel, almost the entire chapter 4. No? She asked the Lord Jesus for the living water that will quench her thirst forever. And the Lord Jesus gave her the word of life that is the gospel. The Roman martyrology lists her in March. One of the lesser known disciples of the Lord also is a woman known as uh, Saint Mary of Cyprus because she is uh, a Cypriot, no? in Spanish, Santa Maria de Chipre. But she is more popular as being the mother of John Mark. Now, this lady, obviously a Christian, was mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles as the house owner where the newly escaped from prison, St. Peter, sought refuge. Her house in Jerusalem must have been a large one because it was also recorded in the Acts of the Apostles that early Christians gathered to her house, or what we may now term as a domos ecclesia, or a home church. Saint Martha of Saint Mary of Cyprus, of Santa Maria di Cipre, uh, also fled Jerusalem during the height of the Christian persecution and moved back to Cyprus, her, her native country, where she continued to preach the gospel. The image on the screen that we used is the image of St. Mary of Chipre by my good friend, Dean Carl Claren of uh, Pagunoy Bulacan. If you're tuned in, Carl, thank you very much for allowing us to use this beautiful image of this woman disciple, Santa Maria de Chipre. The emblems of St. Mary, Mary of Cyprus, mother of John Mark, are a bunch of keys representing her ownership of a sizable house in Jerusalem. Her other emblem is a chalice because legend has it that she kept the cup or the Santo Calis used by Jesus in the Last Supper. And this icon of Din Cartlarin of Fagunoy Bulacan has them both, a bunch of keys on the left hand and a chalice on the right hand. Her feast day is listed for June 29 in the Roman Martyrology. Now, what can we learn from the life of the disciple St. Mary of Cyprus is that we should imitate her generosity to others, open our homes and our hearts, even at the risk of being persecuted for Christ, and open our homes and our hearts to all those who are in need. Thank you, Dean Calteren. And after we have presented the individual saints of the Lenten season, let's now go to the tableau, the Passion tableau, or uh, popularly known as Passos. The first in all Paso is the Paso de la Despedida. In the Tridentine liturgy, the Friday before Palm Sunday, the sorrows of Our Lady is commemorated. Called Viernes de Dolores, or simply Viernes Dolores, it also commemorates the final meeting of Jesus and Mary in Nazareth before he was to go to Jerusalem to fulfill his salvific mission, to suffer and die for us. 
a product of Hispanic, relig Hispanic religious romanticism, the poignant tableau portrays a weeping Mary and a worried Jesus as he bids her farewell for the last time. The two images in this paso were sculpted in four feet scale in the Devistir style by noted Pampanga sculptor, Lake Morrison Yambao, and is privately owned and venerated. The next paso in our lineup is the Paso de la Omenta, literally the step of the donkey, or better yet, the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Jesus was welcomed, praised and acclaimed as the glorious and victorious son of David, the Messiah, as he entered Jerusalem to celebrate the great Passover of that year. Five days later, the same crowd would be demanding for his death, shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. The Paso of the Humenta, or the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, reminds us that the praises and actions an acclamation of men are as feeble as the weather, and we should not be carried away by it. This tableau is owned by Joseph Ricci de la Serna of Balamban, Cebu, and is taken care of by his family. After the Paso de la Jumenta, we have the La Ultima Cena, or the Last Supper. The Last Supper of the Lord gave us two of the seven sacraments, the Holy Eucharist, and holy orders. The first holy mass, as it were, where Jesus ordered his apostles to do it in memory of him and partake of his own body and blood in the appearance of bread and wine. This paso could be represented by a single image of Jesus giving out the bread and wine or by a whole tableau which includes the 12 apostles. In a singular paso, the Lord Jesus is considered, is referred to as Senor Jesus de la Cena, or Lord Jesus of the Supper. The Paso of La Ultima Cena teaches us to be grateful for the gift of the Eucharist, where we can receive the body and blood, soul and divinity of the same Lord Jesus Christ who instituted it. The group picture on the left of your screen is the Last Supper tableau lifted, borrowed from the book Bantayan, published by University of San Carlos Press in Cebu City. After the Last Supper, we have the Agony in the Garden, or the Oración del Huerto. The first sorrowful mystery of the Holy Rosary reflects the total submission of the Lord Jesus to the will of his Heavenly Father. As a consolation, God the Father sent the Archangel Gabriel to him to strengthen him for his passion and death. The mystery of the agony in the garden teaches us to accept God's will and be assured of his consolation and aid in doing it. After that, we have the Señor Jesus Cautivo or the Captive Christ. After the agony in the garden, Jesus was betrayed with a kiss by Judas and arrested by the temple guards of the high priest. Mold and chained, they hold him like a notorious criminal and put him in the dungeon of the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. The Lord spent the first night of his passion as an innocent prisoner in the dungeon of the Jewish high priest. The message to be learned from this paso is to be ready to suffer for our faith anytime. After the paso of the Cautivo comes the Paso of the Señor de la Columna, or Jesus is scourged while tied to a pillar. To quench the bloodthirst of the Jews who demanded from Pilate the death of an innocent man, Pilate ordered that Jesus be given 40 lashes minus one as an act of mercy. Roman lashing is given only to major law offenders, but in the case of Jesus, Pilate wanted to justify the release of the Lord by placating the bloodthirst of those who accused him. The scourging of Jesus fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that by his wounds we are healed. The price of our redemption is beginning to be paid. 
after receiving 39 pasos, the Lord Jesus fainted. Señor Jesus desmayo or the fainted Christ. This paso is one of three strictly Hispanic depictions of what could have happened in the course of the Passion of the Lord. Painting from a severe beating, remember 39 lashes, with a Roman fulcrum, plug room is very likely. To buckle down under extreme pressures in life is a natural human reaction. But we can overcome all our trials by clinging tenaciously into our faith. This is this Mayo Tableau from the book Bantayan, Picture Credits to the University of San Carlos Press. After the desmayo, we have the crowning of thorns or la coronacion spinas. The third sorrowful mystery teaches us to be wary of man's praises and hypocrisy. Just as the Lord Jesus was mockingly crowned with thorns during his passion, not to honor him, but to deride him. This paso should teach those who want to lead to be wary of this yeast of the Pharisee that is hypocrisy and backstabbing, a very appropriate point of reflection for this time of national election. Señor Jesús de Paciencia, or Lord Jesus of Patience. Another one of the three strictly Hispanic representations of the Passion, which reflects the patience and humility of God made man in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, this powerful image of a bloodied and suffering Christ should teach us all a lesson in humility and patience, in imitation of the humility and patience of the Lord Jesus whom we serve. In the other times, the image of Jesus de Pacencia is also used to represent the crowning of thorns. Next, we have the Señor Jesus de la Sentencia, or the Eche Homo. When Pilate presented Jesus before the mob, he uttered the famous words, Behold the man, or Eche Homo in Latin, which means he found no guilt in Jesus, but had him lashed anyway to satisfy the blood thirst of the mob. But the high priest instigated the crowd to ask for the death of Jesus. All through his ordeal, the Lord Jesus remained silent, calm, patient, and forgiving. The pass of this intentia teaches us not to trust on human judgment, but to rely only on the mercy of God. Next is the Paso of the Señor Jesus Nazareno, or the Lord Jesus of Nazareth. In Catholic Spain, the portrayal of Jesus carrying the cross is generally referred to as Jesus Nazareno. In the traditional stations of the cross, there were three falls of Jesus that were commemorated. The Nazareno in the picture depicts the second fall of Jesus carrying the cross. This is the main character of the late 19th century Paso de la Segunda Caída of the Ramon Aboites Foundation Incorporated or RAFI, formerly owned by the family of the first Cebuano Bishop of Cebu, Bishop Juan Bautista Perfecto Gregorio Gorordo y Garces. Señor Jesus Nazareno, the famous image of the Black Nazarene inside in the Basilica ng Itim na Nazareno Paris of St. John the Baptist in Quiapo, Manila, is an example of the first fall where Christ falls on one knee while carrying the cross. This paso is also known as the Primera Caída or the first fall of Jesus. Señor Jesus Nazareno de la Tercera Caída or the Lord Jesus of Nazareth of the Third Fall. This is a rendition of the third fall, Tercera Caida, where Jesus is shown almost flat to the ground with both hands and feet buckling under the heavy weight of the cross. Jesus challenges all his followers, all of us, to take up our crosses daily and follow his example of perseverance, humility, obedience, patience, and forgiveness always. The tableau photo was sourced from the internet. Credits to the owner.
After the third fall, the tenth station of the cross depicts Jesus is stripped of his garments or the Lord Jesus, Senor Jesus Despojado. Jesus has finally reached Calvary at this point. And just as he was stripped of his clothing, we should learn to strip ourselves of all vanity and hypocrisy if we are to follow closely the humility and obedience of our Lord, especially during this time of Lent when our Holy Mother, the Church, call us all to repentance and renewal. This photo of Jesus Despojado was from the book Bantayan, published by the University of San Carlos Press in Cebu City. Before he was crucified, the third of the strictly, strictly Hispanic rendition of the Passion shows how Jesus, stripped of his garments, is thought to be crucified, once more praised for strength and patience to complete his salvific mission of dying for our sins. He carries in his innocent body the penalty due for our sins, penas. That is why this paso is called Jesus of the Penalties or Señor Jesus de las Penas. La Crucifixión. has come to an end with his crucifixion on Calvary. Here he said his last seven words, the first of which asked God his Father to forgive his executioners, for they know not what they are doing. The dying Christ was consoled by the presence of his mother and faithful disciples who stood by him at the foot of his cross in Calvary. May we, who profess to follow Christ, learn to love and forgive and to pray for our enemies as Jesus, as Jesus Christ taught us to do. This is a full picture of the Santo Cristo de Burgos, the patron of the Burgos in the La Victoria families of Cebu, painted in four feet by eight feet scale by the late Cebuano visual artist, award-winning artist, Jesus Rona. Then after the crucifixion or a singular paso, we may also have the paso del Calvario or the tableau of the crucifixion. On the photo, you can see only the three figures of the crucified, the sorrowful mother and St. John. Additional figures could be added, of course, if we are to be faithful to the gospel narratives, we should add St. Mary Magdalene there, St. Longinus, and the other Marys, the other women disciples, and St. Joseph of Arimathea and St. Nicodemus. But for simplicity's sake, and obviously for budget constraints, the three most important characters in the Paso del Calvario are the Crucified, the Mother, and St. John. After his death on the cross, the 13th station of the traditional way of the cross commemorates the removal of the dead body of Jesus from the cross. Now, what can we learn from this station? It is that consoling the family of a deceased person is a very Christian act. Just as John the Beloved, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, Mary Magdalene, the other women disciples, consoled the Blessed Virgin Mary in her sorrow, over the death of her son. El Decidimiento Tablo photo was from the book Bantayan, published by the University of San Carlos Press. After the Paso of the Decidimiento, we have a La Pieta, the piety of the Blessed Virgin Mary. As a subpart of the 13th station of the traditional station of the cross, the Blessed Virgin Mary is pictured lamenting the death of her son while carrying the dead body of Jesus in her arms. The piety of Our Lady calls us to be merciful to those who die unjustly. La Pieta also reminds us that the way of all flesh is physical death, and we should therefore pray for a happy death in the company of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. The La Pieta Tableau is owned by the late Marisa Leonardo and family of Cebu City and is brought out every year 
during Good Friday in the Cathedral of Cebu, in the Metropolitan Cathedral of Cebu procession, burial procession that is. Next, we emphasize the sorrowful mother. The image of the sorrowful mother represents as well the sorrow of the church over the rejection of other people of the message of salvation. The picture of the sorrowful mother teaches us to undergo silent suffering, putting our hope and trust in the mysterious designs of God our Father. May the sorrow of our spiritual mother Mary strengthen us as we bear our own crosses and sorrows in life. Finally, the last of the Passos, El Santo Intiero, the Holy Sepulchre. The image of the dead Christ in the tomb is a reminder to us that our bodies are sacred, having been made temples of the Holy Spirit while alive because of our baptism and our adoption as children of God. Respect and prayers for the dead are recommended spiritual works of mercy by our Holy Mother, the Church. Now we move to the last portion of this lecture, which is uh, the popular piety, practices and devotions of uh, Filipinos, generally speaking. Of course, on all Fridays of Lent, we have the Stations of the Cross, which can be held by families, by individuals, privately or publicly in churches or in gardens appropriate for meditation and prayer. And then we observe abstinence on all Fridays of Lent, beginning on us Wednesday, the start of the Lenten season. Then the Sunday after Palm Sunday, the Sunday after Ash Wednesday, we have the blessings of Palm to commemorate the Lord Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. The Passos Procession. In Old Intramuros, the Recollects spearheaded the observation of Holy Week by holding their Passos Procession on Palm Sunday, also known as Passion Sunday. The Recollects Passos are made up of images, tableau, of the agony in the garden, the scourging at the pillar, the crowning with thorns, and the carrying of the cross. In some other parishes today, the day chosen for Passos procession are either on a Tuesday or Wednesday. But in Bantayan Island, Cebu, the Passos are processed on Monday, Thursday, being a legal holiday where more people can go home and join in the Holy Week celebration in the island. There is no required number of Passos that may be processed in any parish or chapel. Then another tradition a Hispanic popular piety introduced to the Philippines during the colonial period is the Visitas de las Iglesias. The idea of a Visitas de las Iglesias is to spend some time with the Eucharistic Lord and the Blessed Sacrament on the night before he offered his life on the cross for our sake. The focus of this practice is the adoration of the Blessed Sacrament that is placed in a richly decorated altar of repose usually on the gospel side of the sanctuary inside the church. Silent adoration is preferred to maintain the meditative atmosphere inside the church. It is performed in a single or multiple churches. There is no specific number of churches required to be visited. The number of churches to be visited would depend on the penitent spirit of the devotees the distances between churches, and the availability of transportation. Significant numbers observed vary from three, five, seven, nine, or even 14 churches. Three representing the three divine persons of the Holy Trinity of one God. Five representing the five precious sons of Jesus on the cross. Seven for the seven sacraments. Nine for the nine days of waiting for the Pentecost and 14 for the traditional stations of the cross. Now in areas where there is only one parish church, 
like what my mother used to do when we were living in uh, very near San Sebastian in Manila, she would go in and out the different doors of the church five times. And with that, she fulfills her vow of doing the visitas de las iglesias on the evening of Huevi Santo. And it still can be done, especially as I said, in rural areas where there is only one church and the next church is about 20 kilometers away or even further, and which makes it impossible to go by walking or too inconvenient and expensive to go by car. Please note, the Visita Iglesia begins only after the Mass of the Lord's Supper, when the Blessed Sacrament is transferred to the Altar of Repose, not before. And it ends at 12 midnight on Huebe Santo. Hindi siya pwedeng gawin ng alas 3 ng hapon, ng alas 12 ng tanghali, or umaga ng Huebe Santo. Kailangan po muna ang mailipat yung Santissimo Sacramento pagkatapos ng Misa ng Last Supper sa Altar of Repose. After that, papatayin na po ang ilaw sa sanctuary, strip na po ang altar, at ang focus ng attention ng lahat ay naroon na sa Altar of Repose. So atin pong tandaan, kung gusto po natin magbisita iglesia, sumunod po tayo sa tamang paraan. Sumunod pa po tayo sa Misa ng Last Supper, and then kung saan man ang parish natin, doon po natin umpisahan ng unang church. At kung mag-isa lang po yung parish natin na yun at napakalayo ng ibang simbahan, eh di kagaya po ng ginagawa ng nanay ko noon, nakasama kami, na labas masok ng limang ulit sa iisang simbahan. Basta ang mahalaga po, wala pong bisita iglesia bago ilipat ang Blessed Sacrament sa Altar of Repose. At saka ang focus po ng adoration ay ang Blessed Sacrament. Kaya huwag na pong magrurosaryo o magdarasal ng malakas o maingay. Contemplative and meditative praying po ang dapat gawin habang nagbibisita iglesia. Another tradition, pious tradition, is the hearing of the seven last words. No? It commemorates the seven last words spoken by Jesus as he hung dying on the cross in Calvary, called from the Synaptic Gospels. It is held between 12 noon and 3 in the afternoon, and it is held in parish churches or cathedrals. Each word, each sentence is given a deeper reflection by preachers and speakers, both from the laity and the clergy. This is usually now covered by social media or television or radio so that there is no excuse for anybody not to tune in and listen on Good Friday. No? Sa Bierni Santo po ito ginagawa. Buhat alas 12 ng tanghali hanggang alas 3 ng hapon. At pagkatapos po ng alas 3 ng hapon, ginugunita natin ang pagkamatay ng Panginoon sa cross, susunod po ang tinatawag nating veneration of the cross. Now, the veneration of the cross, it is led by the parish priest and an impressive image of the crucified Lord, which is first covered by a red cloth, is gradually presented to the people by removing the right hand side first, then the left hand side, and then the head side. The crucifix is then laid below the sanctuary for public generation until 5 or 6 p.m., when the procession of the burial of the Lord takes place. We, we have here some photos showing the Santo Inchero procession of the different areas in the, in the country. First, we have the procession of the burial in Karkar City Province, and the Camarero of the Santo Inchero there is a good friend Manila-based interior designer Manny Castro, who hails from Karkar. He inherited uh, being the, the custodian of the image and its decorator, of course, from his grandparents yet in the city of Karkar, Cebu. We also have a private devotion to the dead Christ. This image in six feet scale is enshrined and venerated in a private oratory in Cebu City and is also known as Senor de Parian for the district where the oratory is located. 
Then this is the image of the popularly venerated Santo Sepulcro de Paco, also known as Senor de Paco in four-feet scale, enshrined and venerated in the church of San Fernando de Dilao in Paco, Manila. And in Pampang, in Angeles City, Pampanga, there are two venerated images of the dead Christ, uh, both known as Apong Mamakalulu. The old one is uh, enshrined in the Santo Rosario Church, and the other one is uh, has its own shrine, also in Angeles City. Now, after the burial procession of the Santo Entierro on Good Friday, a penitential procession featuring only the Sorrowful Mother Mary is held in some parishes. It's called Procession del Silencio or the La Soledad Procession. And it aims to comfort the Blessed Virgin Mary in her sorrow and solitude on the night of the first Good Friday after burying the dead body of her son. Hindi po hinahanap ng mahal na ina ang kanyang kalilibing lang na anak kasi kasama po siyang naglibing. Ang, ang ginugo ni Tapo natin sa Procession del Silencio ay ang pag-iisa at ang kalungkutan ng mahal na Birhing Maria sa unang gabi ng Bierni Santo na wala na ang kanyang anak. Marami po kasing nagsasabi na hinahanap daw ng mahal na ina ang kanyang anak. Hindi po mangyayari yon dahil kasama po ang mahal na ina nung ilibing ang bangkay ni Jesus sa sepulcro. Kaya atin pong tuwirin ang prosesyon de la solidad. Ang purpose po nito ay hindi samahan si Maria na hanapin ang bangkay ni Jesus. Kung hindi, samahan si Maria sa kanyang pag-iisa at pagdadalamhati. In Spain, it is also called the procession del silencio because no loud prayers, no band accompaniments, no tip music that joins. Only the fervor and sorrow and the silence of the devotees. On the picture is the 1788 image of Nuestra Señora de la Soledad of Madrid in Spain. Now, curious question. What is the difference between the Dolorosa and Soledad iconographies? Well, the Dolorosa iconography of the Blessed Mother in her sorrows has her eyes looking up to the crucified Christ, so eyes fixed upwards. While as a Virgen de la Soledad, her eyes are cast down in melancholy contemplation on the event that transpired on the first Good Friday. Another difference is that the Soledad imagery is usually depicted kneeling, while the Dolorosa is almost always standing. In some Philippine parishes, the Soledad procession is held barefoot by the devotees, and the chanting of the Stabat Mater Dolorosa is allowed and is even appropriate during the Soledad procession. On photo is the miraculous icon of Mesa Senora de la Soledad of San Isidro, Nueva Ecija. So, thank you so much for joining in. We are sorry for the 10 minute interruption. It's a, we have a very bad internet signal here in Cebu, in Guadalupe in particular because probably of the bad weather, but uh, well, all is well that ends well. I'd like to thank my assistant researcher, General Guarin of the Cultural and Historical Affairs Office, as well as Orlan Rumarate, our photographer. And of course, Mayor Michael Rama, for allowing us to share this uh, lecture with you.